Hello, bearded bee people. Welcome back to BNK Bees for another episode of our beekeeping crash course. Today we are going to talk about honeybee parasites, which are some of the biggest threats to your bees' health and survivability. So learning about them and how to control them is a very, very, very good thing to do as a beginning beekeeper. And so first we'll talk about what they are and what they do. Okay, so first up we have uh, one of the lesser known mites that cause our bees problem problems. Uh, back in the day, before Varroa was such a problem, tracheal mites were the mite to worry about. Tracheal mites were everybody's concern, and it's not so much that they're less of a concern now, it's just that there's a mite that is much more of a concern at this time. So tracheal mites are still worthwhile to pay attention to and still worthwhile to apply a dual acting treatment to make sure that you're uh, keeping the tracheal mite load low. Um, but they pale in comparison uh, in terms of importance to the varroa mite. But tracheal mites are very, very tiny mites that go in the bee's tracheal tubes and feed on the bee's hemolymph through it. So they'll bite into the tracheal tube and cause problems with the bee's breathing and respiratory system and uh, also open up the internal organs to pathogens and cause uh, reduced immune systems in these bees where otherwise innocuous diseases can be really, really troublesome. Uh, so the solution here is to manage your bees for overall health. Uh, keep your varroa levels low because varroa is going to bring a lot of those other diseases. Um, try to keep your disease levels low, your nutrition levels high, and apply a dual acting treatment once per year. And when I say dual acting, I mean kills varroa mites and tracheal mites. And for us, that means formic acid in uh, Mite Away Quick Strips or Formic Pro. That'll kill the foundress mites, it'll kill the phoretic mites and the tracheal mites. Um, so I do that once per year, usually in mid-August. All right, so next, the big bastard of them all, the varroa mite. All right, so the varroa mite, it carries with them so many issues and they're so underestimated and they're so damaging to our bees. Uh, this is without a doubt the number one problem you face as a beekeeper. Um, they not only have direct effects of the weakening of the bees that they bite into, but they also bring with them diseases. Uh, not only do they bring with them diseases on them, but they also carry these diseases biologically. So when we're talking about viruses, like say the deformed wing virus, um, the viruses can't exist for very long outside of a host uh, because it's not alive. A virus is really only a, a little strip of RNA or DNA uh, surrounded by a sheath of proteins. It's not alive, it can't replicate on its own. So uh, the, that is uh, not a big thing in and of itself, but when we take the varroa mite into consideration and the fact that they can host these viruses like deformed wing virus, what that causes is more opportunity for these viral packets to, um, to duplicate and also more opportunity for that virus to mutate. So since we've seen the direct correlation of deformed wing virus and uh, varroa mites, we've seen a mutation of this virus that has changed what was a very innocuous infection to a certain death sentence if the levels get high enough. So these varroa mites, like I said, they have direct effects that weaken the bees that they parasitize, but they also bring with them diseases and they inject these diseases into our bees in ways they weren't being introduced before. So they carry with them so many issues that it's just really honestly can't be overstated. In addition to the problems that the mites bring to these colonies, they, they transmit from colony to colony in such illogical and unexpected ways that they're almost impossible to expect. Um, not only do they transfer from hive to hive through drone drift, they also transfer anywhere bees are in contact with each other, whether on a flower or a communal feed source or a communal water source or through robbing of colonies that are dying out. Um, so there's tons of different methods that your hive can acquire mites and with that acquire disease and they have absolutely illogical ways of, of, of going about it. Like I said, uh, robbing can cause your colony what was you know one and a half percent mite load to go up to nine or ten percent very very quickly 
only because they robbed out a colony that was dying out from some type of uh, disease or mite problem. So, like I said, these, these varroa mites are incredibly, incredi incredibly problematic. They bring so many issues with them. It's so, uh, it, it's a very, very important thing that you keep uh, on top of the mite load in every single colony you have every single month. Now, how do these mites pose these problems to the bees is what we'll talk about next. And um, so essentially, an adult mite uh, that is walking around outside of a brood cell, we call a phoretic mite. And uh, so what they do, and these are female mites, um, the large ones that we see that cause all these issues are female varroa mites. And they'll attach themselves to an adult bee feeding on it and weakening that adult bee all the while. Now, when that adult bee comes back to its colony, that mite will time uh, the movement to where it can escape into a brood cell right before that cell becomes capped. And then when that cell does get capped, that mite inside that brood cell will start to feed on the larva that is in it. Um, after feeding on the larva, it will start to lay eggs every few hours. Uh, the first egg will be a male mite, and the rest of them will be female mites. And uh, so, like I said, you know, it, the, the population can get out of hand very, very quickly. And as you can see, one mite enters one cell, and three or more mites may exit. So uh, the, the population can grow exponentially, and uh, the problem can, can become a serious issue just like that. <clears throat> okay, so the solution to the varroa mite problem ultimately is going to be breeding programs like the University of Minnesota and Michigan State and Purdue University and all these awesome intelligent people that are working on uh, creating a bee through genetics and artificial insemination and constant studies and testing, um, creating a bee or a set of bees that has an ability to uh, keep these mite loads in check. Now generally that's hygienic ability, so some type of an ability that the bee has, that the worker bee has to detect the fact that a mite is underneath a brood capping. And then another ability, another set of genetics that would give another bee the ability to go in, remove the diseased larva and the, and the mite, um, and therefore, you know, rid the colony of that mite. So that is what we call hygienic ability, but it is a difficult thing to get into your bees because like I said, they come from two different genetic uh, pieces of information. So it's not like you can have one colony that just happens to have this crazy genetic capability of detecting mites underneath the cappings and then going in to remove them. It has to be sort of created uh, through uh, an intelligent and thoughtful breeding program. And those types of things are going to be what take us out of this mite crisis, definitely. I mean, obviously, I'm a queen breeder as well. I, I'm not on the level of the University of Minnesota, but we definitely uh, select our bees and our queens for mite resistance, disease resistance, and overall survivability. And you guys should do the same in every split you make or every queen you make. Um, but generally, it'll be all of us working together to select for these abilities along with these incredibly intelligent scientists um, that is eventually going to bring us out of this Varroa issue. Now, for the time being, the vast majority of these bees that we work with don't have the ability to keep these mites or these diseases in check, so they need our help. I mean, it should be looked at like a disease or like a cancer. I mean, in the same way, if it was to affect your dog or your horse or your cow, they need our help. We've selected these bees to do specific things for hundreds of years, and while selecting for them to do specific things, we've left out the Darwinian selection that would give them the ability to deal with this stuff. Not only have we not had the Darwinian selection to deal with this stuff, but there was no evolutionary history between varroa mites and European honeybees, so they don't have the ability, they don't know how to deal with these mites. It is incumbent upon us, it is our responsibility 
to take care of these mites, make sure that the mite load is low, and make sure that our disease levels are low. It's our responsibility as a beekeeper in the beekeeping community to keep mites in check. <clears throat> so how do we do that? We advise an integrated pest management solution that would include two chemical treatments and at least one management method. Um, and we'll talk about more about that in the managing varroa section of this crash course. But yeah, like I said, this, the, the importance of varroa mites and uh, understanding the tools that you have to uh, battle the varroa mites are the most important lessons I can teach you here in this beekeeping crash course. Okay, so next up are honeybee diseases, and then after that we'll be talking about varroa management. I know this is not the most fun topic, but these topics, if taken seriously by you beginning beekeepers, will get you into success beekeeping, get you into honey and overwintered colonies, and just tons of success and happiness beekeeping much quicker than if you don't take these things seriously. So. Please take them seriously. I hope you are, and I hope you're digging it, and I hope you get out there and have some fun with your bees. And thank you very much for watching. See ya.